Greetings from Louisville, Kentucky, where we are going to be discussing inclusive issues. Eh, forget that, I don't like it. Greetings. This is Sister Angie Shaughnessy in Louisville, Kentucky, welcoming you to this presentation, Legal Issues in Inclusive Education for the NCEA 2021. We will be talking today about inclusive education for exceptional learners. And we can be offering this education in two ways currently, in person and virtually. Some viewers may have spent the whole year providing virtual or non-traditional instruction as it is sometimes called. Fewer of us may have been in person for most of the year and many of us may have been offering a hybrid version, a combination of in-person and virtual, as we learn and become experts, as it were, in fielding the demands and challenges presented to us in this pandemic time. I believe it is important for all of us to operate from the same type of language the same set of terms and a common understanding of what we mean by those terms. For example, one of these terms is the term disability. What is a disability? Who is an individual with a disability? If we look at the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is often used as the source for the federal definition of disability, we learn that an individual with a disability is one who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities or has a record of such an impairment or is regarded as having an impairment. These three components are very important. Simply because one now has a disability, you might think, doesn't mean that one will have protections in the future. However, the federal act says that you do if you have a record of such an impairment. So if you have a student who is now in the fifth grade but shows that in the first grade he or she had an impairment, that student is covered under the disability protections of federal and state law. A third and somewhat surprising characterization is an individual with the disability is one who is regarded as having an impairment. This means that even if the person does not have an impairment, if he were ever regarded or she were ever regarded as having had an impairment, then the courts may decide that the student has an impairment for the purposes of the ADA or your state, state rules about disabilities. Now, if you'll note, in number one, we're told that this impairment has to substantially limit one or more major life activities. So, a question would be, what are major life activities? If you go to the Americans with Disabilities Act, you will find the major life activities include quite a plethora of items. They include, but are not limited to, caring for oneself, performing manual tasks, seeing, hearing, eating, sleeping, walking, standing, lifting, bending, speaking, breathing, learning, reading, concentrating, thinking, communicating, and working. Some of these can be age-related. Some are not. 
And it's also interesting to consider what isn't said here. I recently represented a young woman in a hearing at the collegiate level who was seeking to enter a program in communications disorders. One of her required courses involved having to spell correctly long names of conditions, drugs, treatments. This wonderful young woman had always had a problem spelling. But if you'll notice, the inability to spell is not considered a major life activity. We could try to make a case that it's part of reading, it's part of thinking, but this was rejected by the university which she attended. So it is important when we're talking about students or even with teachers or other persons who have disabilities to understand that not everything that might at first glance seem a disability is a disability. That does not mean, in my opinion at least, that we don't have a moral obligation to help a person with any sort of limitation, whether that falls into the category of a legal disability. A major life activity can also include the operation of a major bodily function, including, but not limited to, functions of the immune system, normal cell growth, digestive issues, bowel issues, bladder, neurological issues, brain, respiratory, circulatory, endocrine, and reproductive functions. The older the child gets, the harder some of these are to deal with, particularly when students, uh, peers, may not be as understanding. Such things as digestive, bowel, and bladder issues can be difficult for classmates to deal with, and they can be deal difficult for the teachers to deal with. Yet, it is part of our call as teachers of the gospel and teachers in Catholic schools, as well as simply teachers in the American school systems, to bring our students to a realization that we have an obligation, not just a legal one, but also a gospel one, to treat everyone the way Jesus would treat them and the way we would want to be treated. Let's turn for a moment and talk about what we mean by a physical impairment. A physical impairment is any physiological disorder or condition, cosmetic disfigurement, or anatomical loss affecting one or more of the following body systems. Now, let's look at that again. Any physiological disorder or condition, cosmetic disfigurement, or anatomical loss affecting one or more of the following body systems. Neurological, musculoskeletal, special sense organs, respiratory, including the speech organs. So the need for uh, speech therapy can come into play here. Cardiovascular, which is not always so apparent. Reproductive, digestive, genitourinary, hemic and lymphatic, skin and endocrine. Now, as you know, I am a lawyer and I am also um, a person with long experience in teaching. I've served as a principal, I've served as a dean, served as a professor, as a vice president, and as legal counsel in two universities. 
So I've dealt with these terms for a long time. I know how difficult they can be. And this is simply an attempt to introduce you to them or to provide a quick review. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the things that are involved in providing accommodations. So that's physical impairment. We're all fairly familiar with that. And after this year of the pandemic, we certainly have seen many people, not just on respirators, but on life support systems. And we understand perhaps a little better than we did in the past that it, life is very fragile. What is a mental impairment? A mental impairment can be a psychological mental disorder or it can be found under one of these terms. Schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, paranoia, anxiety, anorexia nervosa, autism, and autism spectrum. Schizophrenia, split personality, I think we probably don't see a great deal of that today in our classrooms. We do see and deal with students who have bipolar disorder. Depression, something that no one was talking about in students 50 years ago, is certainly something that we're seeing today. And we may find ourselves saying, in this pandemic, I am really depressed. And psychologists and psychiatrists tell us that is a normal reaction. But when the depression begins to affect other life activities, I can't get out of bed in the morning. Uh, I don't want to get up off the couch. We see these in students. We know that we have moved into an area where there could be considered a mental or a psychological impairment that can require accommodations. Anorexia nervosa, most of us are familiar with. Autism and autism spectrum uh, has, has, is a topic that has grabbed our attention in the last 25 years. And we talk routinely about people on the spectrum. And we need to know that being on the spectrum does not mean that you necessarily have autism. You could have sensory processing issues or other forms of being on the spectrum that don't result in a diagnosis of autism. What about emotional issues? A picture of this little guy is a picture that many of us have probably seen. A girl or boy or as the case may be, just rage. And maybe we feel like that today in many ways when we look at what we have been through for over a year. And while we hope we're coming over to the other side, to the end of it, we know that we still have miles to go before we can sleep on this issue. So what sorts of things are individual emotional issues? Ask this young woman. Well, depression. I spoke a little bit about that. And you know, again, I'm not coming at this as a medical person, person in any way, but as a lawyer and as someone with a long career in education. Suicidal ideation. This is something that we are seeing over and over and over again in our students. I probably wrote for the first time on this topic 25 years ago. It's still there. We still have to be aware that students are thinking about taking their lives. They can be thinking about it. And we should never say, oh, he or she would never do that. Every month, if not every week, I hear about someone 
who took their life and the survivors and their friends cannot believe that this individual ever had a suicidal thought. Bullying and cyberbullying. There are books written about this. Jody Blanco has written some of the best books on the market, as I'm sure many of you are aware. We have to take the position that no bullying, that bullying is never acceptable, and that no bullying should be the mark of a Catholic school. With cyberbullying, bullying online, it's becoming harder and harder sometimes to keep up with the bullying claims. Doesn't mean we have to become the cyber police. It does mean, though, that when we are presented by a student with a claim of being bullied or cyber bullied, that we will report it to our supervisor, our principal, our dean, uh, our president, whomever we're supposed to support it, to report it to, and that we will follow up with whatever investigation we are asked to make. Rage. Fairly new in my listing. 10, 12 years ago, I wouldn't have listed rage as something that we should be looking out for. But today I have to. Picture I saw, I showed just before this slide, a little boy, angry. Well, there's anger, there are tantrums, and then there's rage. And if we see rageful behaviors that go beyond this anger, we need to go to our superior, uh, our supervisor, and say, I think I have a rage issue with one of my students, what should we do? If I'm the principal, then I need to have a cadre of tools that I can use, people that I can call, instruments that I can access, experts, so that I can get some help. And always remember, the parents need to be part of the team. The parents or the guardians need to be part of the team. A new one is, fairly new one, emotional abuse at home. Now, probably the vast majority of people who have ever had parents at some time in their life thought they were emotionally abused. A guilt trip. That's not emotional abuse, unless it's carried to an extreme. I remember, as a junior in high school, many years ago, having a religion teacher. Her name was Sister Mary Calisanctious, Sister of Mercy. And she used to say to us all the time, girls, extremes are always bad. And that's what I think we need to keep in mind here. You can exercise too much. You can eat too much or eat too little, you can exercise too little. You can do all sorts of things. You can express your emotional exasperation if you're a teacher or a parent. But we have to be careful because we can cross the extreme line into the line of emotional abuse. And a host of others are out there waiting. So we may be asking ourselves at this point, well, are, are all these issues medical? Most of them will have some sort of medical basis. Disabilities are generally not recognized, at least at first, unless we can find them in the DSM. If we can't find them in the diagnostic manual, then we may be seeing uh, a situation where we're going to be the groundbreaker, which probably none of you want to be, or we have a, a, a behavior or a situation or a feeling from a student that crosses over into the medical. Most of the issues I'm talking about today have some basis 
in medicine. One of the issues that we see a lot is substance abuse. Unfortunately, substance abuse is growing in virtually every segment of the population. What is substance abuse? Well, you can find definitions, but we all have an idea of what it means. It means that we are using a substance to excess. We are self-medicating. Uh, it is not a crime to be a person who has a substance abuse issue. Now, what you do with this substance abuse issue is another question. I remember hearing a psychiatrist, psychiatrist talk once who said, the moral issue may not be, or the ultimate moral issue may not be, that you chose to get drunk or drink to excess. The moral issue is you chose to put yourself in a situation where you might get back in a car and drive. And so those then move from simply medical or physical issues into moral issues. But right now we're talking about substance abuse. And for most of us, uh, when we talk about it, we think of alcohol or drugs or both. Uh, we are now seeing children as young as seven and probably younger, but the most recent uh, materials I looked at talked about children as young as seven having issues with alcohol, uh, which is very sad. We have to remember this, though. Alcohol abuse and drug abuse are generally diseases. Once a person has progressed to the point where they can't stop drinking when they plan to, are they routinely turned to alcohol or drugs if they feel bad or depressed? They moved over into being addicted. And so how do we deal with this? I didn't put a needle on this slide, but I could have. Because what's killing our kids today in the greatest numbers, as you probably know, is the drug fentanyl. And fentanyl is found in uh, pills that are told they're sold or given to, to young people and told that there's something else. Kids are thinking they're buying heroin or cocaine. They don't know that it's laced with fentanyl or pure fentanyl. Um, one of my dearest friends lost her grandson to uh, a drug I injected, and it turned out to be pure fentanyl. I had no idea that was what he had. So it's not simply a question anymore of alcohol abuse or taking too many narcotics. It's taking things that will kill you on the first intake. So are we dealing with a dis disease, a disorder, or a choice? Well, we could be dealing with all three. Uh, we're definitely dealing with a disease if a person has progressed to the point where they can't stop without some outside intervention. Disorder is another word that is often used. And the line between disorder and disease can be blurry. But when a person no longer has a choice, they have definitely become an addict. And I know that some people will say everybody has a choice, but there is a point in which a person crosses over. It's protect, if you are a user, if you are, uh, or your student is a current user of drugs or alcohol, then they are protected under the Rehabilitation Act. They are also protected if they had a history of being uh, a drug user or an alcohol abuser, or if they were regarded, if you remember back to those earlier slides I had up. So we talk about, well, in-school use, 
Anyway, that's got a whole new meaning today because it can be the student that you're looking at on the screen or under the influence. Does it make any difference? Well, in every state in the United States, to my knowledge today, the drinking age is 21. Years ago when I was a high school principal, the drinking age was 18. And I remember parents arguing with me, not all of them, but a few, that if the students had a drink before school, it wasn't any of my business because they were old enough to drink. These were seniors at the time. I said if it was infecting their performance in school, it was my business. But what's the proper response? Most of our schools, I believe, are responding the same way they would respond if someone had a depression situation, a broken leg, and they're seeing it as a question of a medical issue. So I believe the proper response is one of compassion, not punishment, because First of all, I think that's what Jesus would do. And secondly, any kind of drug or alcohol use that results in a habit um, is going to be seen as falling under the Protection and Rehabilitation Act. So what's our response? Let's try to get this person some help. Let's have the student or the teacher or the principal, it could even be, have an assessment. Follow the recommendations of the assessment. Can you require counseling? Absolutely. Now, you can't require a report of what was discussed in counseling, but you can require a report that the individual, student or employee, is going to counseling and, in the opinion of the counselor, is making reasonable progress. I can't really answer the next question. How many chances do you give? Well, I think there's a point in a school where you may have to say, third time, this is probably not the place for you to be if you're a student. You probably need to be in a residential program. Perhaps the same way with an employee. This is not to say that three is never the charm, or four, or five. But it does say that we're trying to operate a school, and if your illness has made it impossible for you to function as we expect students to function, and or your presence is keeping other students from getting the education that they're here for, you may have to leave. Now, we may be able to assist you in finding uh, an inpatient program. We may be able to send work. And then we'll assess whether or not coming back to this situation is the best thing for you. I also had relapse on the previous slide. Uh, we're told that something like 70% of alcoholics, at least, can be expected to relapse. That's a sad factor. But as I said earlier, how many times can you give a person another chance is one that the administration has to make. What are some reasonable accommodations for other issues? So. Students have the right to reasonable accommodations for asthma and allergies. Asthma is probably easier to deal with than some of the allergies. Now, if you have asthma, as I do, you might say, well, gee, having asthma is no picnic, and I understand that. So we have to let students have inhalers, and we have to let them bring them to school and carry them with them. 
Having an inhaler in a teacher's desk is of no use if the student is out on the playground. And we will get back to normal. Uh, and one day, we'll look back on this pandemic time. Allergies. Food allergies are a big deal in Catholic schools and in all schools today. Uh, 25 years ago, it was peanut butter everybody talked about. And as the aunt of a young man who is now in his 20s, who is allergic to peanut butter, I can tell you that it can be a very serious problem. And peanut butter allergy is seen as a disability, and you will have to do whatever needs to be done to deal with that allergy in a reasonable way. If you need more information, uh, you want to discuss it, please just email me get in touch with me, and I'll be glad to uh, discuss it with you. Service animals. The courts have been very clear that if a student needs a service animal, needs it, that we have to accommodate. Now, it's easier said than done, and I am someone who is allergic to dogs, so I understand the person who does not want a dog in a classroom. However, that young person has a right to have his needs or her needs accommodated. So we'll have to do whatever we can do to make it work, which may mean, in my own case, um, as a college professor, I would ask a student, would you mind sitting in the back because I'm allergic to dogs? Or you can sit in the front and I'll go in the back and talk. Um, be reasonable. I've heard so many heartwarming stories of teachers who were afraid of dogs, scared of dogs, didn't want dogs in the classroom, and then ended up being glad the dog was there. Uh, now, let me be really clear. The only legal service animal, or the only service animal that legally has to be allowed in a school on a showing of need, medical need, is a dog. Not a cat, not a parakeet, not a mouse, not anything like that that people have tried to bring in the past. It's the same sort of thing we see going on in the airlines. Uh, several of whom have recently announced there will be no more comfort animals. We're not talking about comfort animals here. We're talking about service animals. And a service animal must be a dog. Heart conditions are a situation uh, that can occur. And we have to, if we have a student with a heart condition, uh, we need to know everything that the doctor wants us to know about how to deal with that. Diabetes, I've heard so many stories. I've even represented people that have really made my heart cry because of schools not wanting to keep a diabetic child because they were insulin dependent and had to have injections. Now, some states only will allow a nurse to give an injection. In that case, if you don't have a school nurse, the parent may come to school and give the injection or family member, something like that. But you can't say, we're not going to deal with that here. People have tried it, and it won't work legally. So the question then becomes, who's to blame if something goes wrong, terribly wrong? That's what happens in court. Courts decide what went wrong, is it terribly wrong? Uh, who should bear the responsibility for whatever injury there is. We also have communicable infectious diseases. These are a little bit uh, more cut and dried in terms of how to deal with them because a student can't be in school. Lice. Uh, I've never had had lice as a principal uh, in my school, but uh, head lice is a, can be a real problem, I know, particularly in elementary schools. And once you have head lice, you have to go home. 
infantigo, you need to go home because it spreads. Hepatitis A, B, and C, same thing. Pertussis and whooping cough and polio, unfortunately, are coming back. I was named for my father's youngest sister who died of whooping cough. Now, you can imagine, this was over 80 years ago over 90 years ago, we thought, uh, excuse me, we thought whooping cough had been eradicated, but it's fact because people are not getting their children vaccinated. That's a topic for another uh, webinar, but it is important to note that we can require that students receive vaccinations before they come to school. Polio is coming back. And I want to note here that HIV AIDS is not contagious, but you almost never hear of it today because it's controlled or it is cured. Students with disabilities have a right to reasonable accommodations that Catholic educators or any educators for that matter cannot ignore. And these are just some of the situations that we're dealing with. ADD, ADHD, ODD, that's oppositional defiant disorder, which probably most of us have at some time or the other. Depression, anxiety, huge. When I was a high school principal, and that's going back almost 40 years now, it was unheard of for someone to say they were depressed. At least one of the high school students. Uh, and really move into psychiatric care. Uh, yes, some people were depressed. Occasionally someone would go to a medical doctor, but certainly not the uh, extent we hear today. Diabetes, heart issues, vision problems. Most vision problems that we see at the elementary and secondary level can be corrected, but not all. So if this student is close to being blind, then we are going to have to do uh, some, make some accommodations. We may have to let the student sit up front. We may have to um, get a special kind of computer, although it should be less and less of a problem today hearing problems. As someone who is now uh, having hearing problems, I can really resonate with young people who are saying I can't hear. And so why has a student not had hearing uh, tests? Usually they have them in school. Is there a problem with getting the student a hearing aid? Is cost a factor? Well, how can we help? And food allergies. I've mentioned those before in terms of peanut butter. Um, and other allergies that are out there. Some of the accommodations that we want to see uh, or we may uh, offer to people, test, we talk about tests and exams. And actually, I have more experience with this at the collegiate level than I ever had at the elementary or high school level. But one of the things that can be called for, or some of the things that can be called for are extended time, Fewer test items, which is almost universally uh, complained about by other people, not the one who's getting the fewer test items. But if the goal is to test comprehension, if we can determine that in two items, why do we need six? A quiet room with no interruptions. Every school should try to have some place where a child can go, be supervised, and take a test or whatever uh, program or work is being done. A reader. Some students have such problems with either reading or with sight that one of the accommodations that will be listed is for the student to have a reader. Other kinds of accommodations are extended deadlines, which can be problematic when you have deadline upon deadline. 
being pushed further into the future. Seating in the front. This can be because you have a vision problem, but it can also be because you have an attention problem. A scribe, someone to take notes for the student, or shared PowerPoints or whatever you're using. Another um, item of the pens that you can get that uh, allow someone to record. I know some teachers don't like this, but remember, the reason we have schools is so that students can learn. So as a teacher, we may have to kind of, as they say, suck up a few things that we don't like and let the student have what the student needs for the student's best performance. Giving presentations only to the instructor and not to the group and tutoring. We're also looking for documentation. Um, and this, this can be in ways of uh, psychometrist report, a psychologist report, social worker report, test results, individual ed plans, observations from trained observers. Once again, I want to put these up here that students with disabilities have a right to reasonable accommodations that educators cannot ignore. And again, I list the things we have to be concerned about, from ADD to ODD, from depression and anxiety to food allergies, from food allergies to heart issues. Because in the end, we want to move from this picture to this picture. We want our students to be happy, to be healthy, to be excited about living and learning, and to live in the freedom of the children of God. Thank you for your time and attention. God bless you.